Hi there, Psych class. Welcome to part two of chapter two uh, on basic structures of the brain. And um, you learned about uh, the limbic system and the brain stem and all those basic structures in your first video. And now we're going to get into some more complex things here. And so first we're going to talk about what's known as the cerebral cortex, okay, which is just a thin layer of neurons that cover uh, the cerebral hemispheres. Um, this is where the body's ultimate control and information processing centers live. Um, networks of those neurons that you learned about in class um, are there to help you interpret or perceive, to help you think, speak, and, and so much more. And so you can see that... Um, Concerning the structure of our cortex, we have um, two hemispheres of the brain, the left and the right, and each can be divided into four lobes of the cerebrum. And so there are the different ones, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and, os and occipital, um, and we will label those in some activities in class. And so let's talk about some other things that we can also find within those lobes of the cerebrum. Um, we have what's called the motor cortex, which is at the back of the frontal lobe, and that controls voluntary movement. So um, body areas that require very precise control occupy the most cortical space. Um, the sensory cortex is at the front of the parietal lobes and that's what, where uh, information from your senses is going to uh, be registered uh, concerning touch and so the more sensitive your body region is there's obviously more devoted to it and so these funky looking pictures here what in the world is this um, give you a nice graphic and so look at output on the left right your motor cortex you can see um, like your face controls actually a lot of space because uh, from facial expressions to forming uh, your mouth for for certain parts of speech um, you obviously need a lot of um, cortex cortical area devoted to doing those things right um, and then sensory cortex right feeling the things uh, the input is, is, is quite similar there and so that probably explains why uh, you know we kiss people with lips a much more sensitive and precise area than we do uh, rubbing elbows as a sign of affection and um, in addition to motor and sensory, we can also talk about vision and hearing. And so your vision is processed in the visual cortex, which is in that occipital lobe at the back of the cerebrum. And sounds are going to be processed in the auditory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe. Um, we know um, the auditory cortex is in the temporal lobe from brain scans that we did of people and actually um, people who suffer from schizophrenia when they when they have auditory hallucinations like they hear voices that aren't really there um, the auditory cortex is is highly illuminated on a PET scan or an MRI um, showing that you know whether they actually had uh, sound enter the ear it doesn't matter the auditory cortex is indeed uh, interpreting sound. Um, so sensory and motor areas occupy a quarter of all that space uh, in the cortex. Uh, the remaining association areas are just going to be networks of neurons that uh, give us hu the human power of thinking, right? Learning, remembering, speaking, um, and association areas are in all four lobes. And so that makes it a lot harder to map than sensory motor areas or the vision and the hearing. Um, so when people ask things like like, you know, um, well, why did I forget, you know, these things for the test? Like, where in my brain are those pieces of information stored? Um, the brain's not quite that simplistic. And so you can see that the more evolved we get in complexity of thought and, and speech and, and things, the more association areas the brain has, with human beings obviously having the most uh, area devoted to complex uh, tasks. 
uh, in the frontal lobe, we can do some general guidelines. And this isn't to say that everything related to these things is stored exactly in the frontal lobe, but it seems to be a general rule, again, from research on different brain scans. So your frontal lobe is actually the last lobe to fully develop, and it enables uh, judgment, plan planning, and processing of new memories. Uh, damage to it um, can make people very spontaneous. Um, and serious damage can actually alter a person's personality um, and, and they would have unrestrained moral judgments like bad decision makers. Um, an example of this is, is a famous case study done in 1848 on a man named Phineas Gage. Um, he was a 25 year old railroad worker and an explosion at a uh, rail yard actually sends a railroad spike through his skull. Um, it's amazing that the man even lived. Um, he could still speak, he could still work, but people noticed that post um, accident, he went from a very friendly, soft-spoken guy to being very irritable, uh, very profane, and very dishonest. And so take a peek -see there. Uh, there's Phineas uh, in the second picture there, post-accident. I mean, obviously lost an eye in the deal. But, um, and the, there's his actual skull, which was devoted, um, donated to science upon his death. Um, and then the computer-generated image that, uh, based on his damage, and uh, forensics on his skull would show you exactly where that spike went up through um, his you know, jaw and cheekbone and out the top of his head. Um, concerning language, again, as a general uh, rule, we know that there are some specific areas of the brain that uh, help us with language, uh, but again, it doesn't mean that it's just happening here. Um, but we know that uh, there are two different areas. Uh, they're called Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and they're called this because, hey, those are the guys that discovered the uh, areas in their research, and so they named them after themselves. But Broca's area is what uh, directs muscle movement for speech. So it controls expression. So if it's damaged, people stutter. Uh, they have a very hard time forming words. Um, sometimes stroke victims uh, might have damage to Broca's area and have a difficult time speaking. Uh, strangely enough, most people with damage here can still sing. So singing uh, must happen in a different part of the brain, in a different association area. Uh, where Nikki's area is language comprehension and expression. And so if it's damaged, um, people might speak meaningless words or they're unable to understand something that somebody else says or s something that they've read.